Uh, good morning again, everybody. I'm uh, really excited um, to um, be able to introduce and moderate uh, our fourth panel, our first panel of the day on fintech and financial inclusion. We've um, got a really great uh, lineup. Um, Pawan Bakshi is the India country lead for financial services for the poor initiative at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Kay McGowan um, used to run the digital finance lead at USAID and now is a professor at Georgetown University. Uh, Josh Sledge is the director of the Center for Financial Services uh, Innovations um, FinTech Project. And Luz Arishia is the CEO of the Opportunity Fund, and they've got just a depth and breadth of experience here that I'm, I'm uh, just uh, thrilled uh, to see. And um, we're going to, I think, go in this order when we get to the panel. I'm going to just say a few words by way of um, introduction uh, to the panel. Um, we have been uh, talking over the last um, a day about uh, trade-offs in innovation and regulation um, at a um, um, at a very um, uh, uh, both high level and then uh, micro level, microstructure level. And, you know, we've been talking about the basic um, issue that uh, fintech um, innovation um, is really kind of central to uh, growth. It's central to um, uh, development. It's central to a vibrant economy, but it can also hide new risks. Um, and trying to think about how to get that balance right, I think, is um, absolutely um, a critical, uh, but I also think that um, if you look back over the course of uh, economic history, you can see cycles of getting this more or less uh, right. That is, it's very hard to find a time where you said, geez, this uh, balance is perfect. Um, what tends to happen is that uh, innovation happens and uh, both the market and policymakers make errors in that course of that innovation. Um, they make errors sometimes in the direction of holding back innovation um, in ways that um, stifle growth or that uh, lock in incumbency, um, lock in oligopolistic tendencies, lock in power. Um, or they make mistakes in the opposite direction and they unleash um, the market and policymakers unleash a set of activities that um, whose upsides uh, blind uh, the public to the downside risks until we have some event like the financial crisis in 2008. Um, and then um, we realize that uh, some of those risks were risks that maybe we shouldn't have taken. Uh, and then, um, then we try and uh, correct for them. And then we forget about the cycle we just went through and we do it again. Um, so part of the point of having these um, conferences and these discussions is to try and learn continuously over time and avoid uh, amnesia and avoid the mistakes of either um, locking in what I call here the dinosaurs, locking in the incumbents, um, and the other danger of um, unleashing risks that are too great for society in relation to the gains that might be had from innovation. So uh, innovation can come in lots of forms. And um, one of the forms that innovation can come in um, is in the form of uh, regulatory innovation. So innovation can happen in the private sector. Innovation can happen in the regulatory sector. So I just thought it would be worth um, uh, thinking about some of the regulatory innovations in consumer finance and financial inclusion that have happened um, in uh, in recent times. And you can see here, um, this is not meant to be an exhaustive list, but a suggestive one. Uh, one example of innovation that I think is quite uh, useful in the regulatory space for financial inclusion is the idea of crowdsourcing. Um, so if you think about uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's um, consumer complaint database. Uh, one way to think about it is as a crowdsourcing function. The, the CFPB uses, can use and uses uh, the complaint database as a way of crowdsourcing its collection of information about uh, potential problems in the marketplace. And that information can then be used by the CPB not only to resolve 
individual complaints with respect to financial firms, but also as a tool for understanding what problems either exist in the market in terms of uh, potentially non-compliance with existing laws and practices, uh, but also even in areas where the thing being complained of is perfectly lawful, um, seeing problems in the marketplace that might suggest that the rules of the game should be changed. That is, that um, the activity involved might be creating problems that should suggest uh, uh, policy change, legal change, uh, regulatory change. Um, a second um, uh, example of innovation that's been happening in the last uh, few years is uh, innovation that uses um, uh, insights from psychology, from behavioral economics to shape uh, the approach to um, regulation itself. So uh, those of you who look at your credit card statements, um, the ability to see in your credit card statement uh, what happens if you only make the minimum payment um, and uh, how much money you would save if you paid off your credit card uh, in a shorter time frame. Uh, that's a, a behavioral nudge um, that is um, prompted by research in this area. Or in the mortgage area, you can think of the rules that were set up for qualified residential mortgages or qualified mortgages. These are rules uh, on the one hand on the consumer side and the other on the safety and soundness side that anchor the market in a safer mortgage product. Uh, and uh, there's still other mortgage products that are available that are not qualified mortgages, but if you step outside the line of this qualified mortgage, there are heightened standards of care, mm -hmm. heightened disclosures, and heightened risks for the uh, provider of those mortgages. It's a way of anchoring the market in a, in a safer product. Um, a third kind of uh, regulatory innovation in the consumer area is a... Um, what in the UK you can think of as um, uh, uh, sandboxes. In the US, uh, we, of course, I, uh, I will get the phrase that was used yesterday slightly off, but I think that it, our regulatory system was described as uniquely fragmented. Um, in our uniquely fragmented system, um, we have different agencies doing different things. The, the, we heard from uh, Amy Friend yesterday about the OCC's Office of Innovation. The Consumer Financial uh, Protection Bureau uh, has a um, a uh, office called Proje a project called Project Catalyst um, to encourage innovation. We're going to hear more about that in a panel later today. Uh, and then there are um, uh, data uh, innovation. So uh, the the uh, OFR has been a leader in data innovation in the regulatory space with the creation of the legal entity identifier uh, and. Um, there is the potential for innovation under the Consumer uh, Financial Protection Bureau in the form of the requirement in the Dodd-Frank Act for information about one's own account to be provided in a machine-readable format. Uh, and as I'll say in a minute, I think that is a, an important uh, potential for improved consumer products. So <clears throat> um, there are lots of potential topics. Um, we're going to talk about... Um, I don't know, somewhere between four and a dozen of them in just a moment. Um, but um, we were talking a lot um, yesterday when we got to topics of financial inclusion in the course of other panels. Most of the discussion was around um, credit access. But you heard Lael Brainerd, um, I think, rightly focus a lot on issues of consumer autonomy um, that are related to um, ownership of one's own financial data. And uh, for my own part, I think that is a, a critical new area um, uh, to consider uh, to make progress on. If consumers can have better control of their own consumer uh, financial data, uh, lots of potential upsides follow, including um, uh, the better ability, for example, to um, switch bank accounts if your bank behaves badly. Um, so if I can if I can port all of my information in my bank account, all of my connections I've set up, my direct debits and my, um, my direct deposits, if I can switch my bank account the way I can take my um, telephone number from one phone to another phone um, or even to another carrier, if I can do that seamlessly and efficiently, 
um, we will dramatically enhance competition in the financial services market. Um, financial firms right now um, know that they can impose enormous pain on you uh, before you will switch bank accounts. Um, and so uh, they tend to do that uh, with high contingent fees and lower quality service than would otherwise be available to you if there were real and meaningful competition um, for switching your bank account. Uh, and if it were easier to do that, we'd enhance competition and we would uh, potentially reduce overdraft charges, reduce insufficient fund charges, um, reduce other kinds of contingent fees and improve the quality of service. So I think it's an exciting new area. And the CFPB's authority to um, require firms to provide your information to you in machine-readable format is an important way that we can begin to uh, enhance that competition. Um, there are um, uh, lots of other um, issues I'm hoping we're going to get to with our panel, including the important um, issues with respect to know your customers, anti-monitoring, laundering rules, and their effect on remittances uh, that you'll hear more about. So uh, what are some of the key issues that we'll be talking about um, on this panel? Uh, again, uh, illustrative to get the juices flowing rather than exhaustive. Um, what are some of the um, uh, key concerns? What do we mean by consent? Um, how do we decide whether a consumer has consented to participate in a financial product um, or service? Uh, you heard quite a bit about that um, uh, from um, from Governor Brainerd. Issues of privacy and data security, um, privacy in the sense of what are the rules of the game that decide when a, a, f a fintech or a bank has the right to use my information and for what purposes and what for, for what time period. Data security, are we protecting that information from, um, from abuse, um, as in the Equifax case? Um, what should we do about uh, identity authentication? How do we make it easier, for example, for uh, immigrants to this country to document their own identity or in other countries, as you'll hear uh, from Pawan, um, how do we make it a lower cost for the population as a whole uh, to be able to authenticate themselves? Uh, issues of consumer protection, uh, getting the balance right, as I've talked about, of access uh, efficiency. Uh, the resiliency of the system uh, we um, create, and and for me at least, does that underlying system empower individuals? Does it enhance autonomy uh, of individuals um, or not? So we have a, a a really full agenda. I'm looking forward to our discussion um, today, and um, with that, let me turn it over to Kay to get us started. Thanks so much. Hi, good morning. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much to Michael for the invitation and um, to the Office of Financial Research and especially to Christy and, and Ginny. I used to try to organize um, a similar type of forum when I still worked for the U.S. government, so I know how, uh, how taxing just the organizational and administrative side of it can be. This has been a great event so far. Okay, so as Michael mentioned, um, I just left the U.S. government, the U.S. Agency for International Development, after seven years. Um, I had been at the State Department for 10 years before that. While at USAID, um, I had the very, very fun opportunity to be able to help um, reshape a long-standing financial inclusion portfolio um, that the U.S. government primarily directed into supporting microfinance industries starting in the 1980s and 1990s to um, really be able to embrace this opportunity that was presented by, um, by FinTech, I guess. Now, you'll see on my slide, um, I'm half joking when I say FinLowTech. Um, but I'm also being being serious in that, you know, you're not going to hear me talk about latency arbitrage or any of the fancy things that people discussed yesterday. I mean, what's really sort of transforming uh, financial services sectors uh, in most developing economies is actually pretty simple. It's been the spread of the mobile telephone. And that's not even smartphones. That's actually just basic 2G feature phones, right? 
Um, this is any phone that has the ability to send a text or connect to a USSD channel. And so it's, um, while it's very exciting, and I would argue that the, the pace and the scale of innovation that we're seeing in emerging markets is actually um, kind of blows what's happening in, in the developed economies away, it's, uh, it is really focused on very practical technologies for the most part. Oh, I wanted to ask if anyone, I chose this, um, I chose this photo because it's very topical. So this is um, from a market in, in a uh, sub-Saharan African country. Can anyone guess? There's a big clue in the currency that's being used. This is from a market. No? There you go. Very good. So yeah, of course, the Zimbabwean market dollarized um, a, a decade ago to be able to stop hyperinflation. And actually, because of that, because of the fact that they use the dollar, um, they, which they obviously can't mint themselves, um, mobile payments have had incredibly fast and ubiquitous uptake. Right. And it's mostly because, as you can imagine, in Zimbabwe, you want to make a lot of purchases for very small amounts of money. However, if you can't find a quarter or a nickel, um, you know, and there's not enough even dollar bills around, you, you get stuck, right? And so the, a great advertising campaign from the big mobile money provider in Zimbabwe was how mobile money can help you replace getting sweets for change. Because a lot of store owners, if they couldn't make change, you know, you'd buy something very small and they'd give you, <laughs> you'd have to pay with a dollar. And instead of giving you back 50 cents, they'd give you a bag of candy. <laughs> All right. So I just want to go over sort of the global landscape a little bit. Um, the big official number that we use in this industry is that 2 billion adults globally are completely excluded from the formal banking sector, from the formally regulated financial services sector. I personally um, am confident that that really actually understates the size of the problem because you have, <laughs> I can tell you, <laughs> because I, you, you also have a lot of people, hundreds of millions, if not billions of more people that may be in kind of low cost, no frills bank accounts, but they don't use those bank accounts for very much. Those bank accounts don't, um, don't sort of give them the tools they need to manage their resources and take advantage of economic opportunity. Um, but that's, that's the stat that we used. That number is actually going down, which is great. There has been a big focus in the international development community globally to really kind of unstick um, the, the banking sector. But the reason it's so important and why we care about people that are extremely poor having access to safe, affordable financial services is, um, you know, it, it may be a little counterintuitive, right? If you don't have any money, why do you need a bank? Um, but in fact, you know, there's been wonderful, rich, qualitative and quantitative research now over many, many years that demonstrates that um, even very poor families and, and people are extremely active users of financial services, um, right? It's just that they're um, using sort of unsafe uh, and much more expensive and much less convenient services, right? And so this old adage that it's expensive to be poor really applies to the financial services sector among, among the world's poor and extreme poor. And, you know, I think we'll hear a little bit about this when we get to talking about uh, financial health in the United States. But even though the, the level of degree is different, I think some of the, um, some of the fundamental challenges are the same, right? In particular, for the, for the world's very poor, it's income volatility, right? We always talk about this, um, you know, the poverty line globally as being someone that lives uh, for $2 a day, right? But in fact, the vast majority of the world's poor have extremely um, irregular incomes. So it's not that they're getting $2 a day. It's that they're, you know, some days they'll get nothing and maybe a harvest will come in and they'll get 50% of their yearly income. Uh, so this obviously leaves people very vulnerable to, to any sort of financial shock. Um, on the flip side, um, you, you have, a, you know, some pretty, some pretty <laughs> incredible estimates of what digitizing emerging economies could result in. 
in terms of uh, increased productivity, um, both at the micro level, so to individuals, at the macro level as, uh, as assets and, and investments get, um, get made more productively, and then of course to governments. So there was kind of a, a big flagship McKinsey Global Institute report that came out last year that estimated that if we were to fully digitize all transactions in emerging economies, across the board, you'd get a GDP boost of 6%. That number is actually much higher in, in big countries that are quite poor and quite, um, quite analog still, like the Nigerias of the world, India, which is moving. Um, you know, there are estimates that you could get up to 10 or 12% boost. Um, and then that third point about governments is something that I focused on a lot when I was working at USAID, um, which is that governments and public sector spending, especially in emerging economies, tends to be very leaky, right? So you, I, I, got, I got to design about 10 years ago and now sort of infamous um, trial of paying Afghan policemen, a group of 49 Afghan policemen, by mobile phone uh, to replace a test or to replace the normal trusted agent of the bank who would carry bags of cash out to the hinterlands. And, you know, it's pretty stunning. Um, you know, if you subtracted all of the transaction fees along the way, the, the police officers ended up getting about 40% more when in fact they were being just paid in full. Um, there's a lot of lore in the development community around that test. I'd be happy to talk to anyone that's interested, <laughs> but it did happen. Um, and, and that's something too I think Pawan will actually talk about because India, which has been a real incredible driver of what's happening right now in, in rethinking financial um, systems and the technology layers that can underpin access and inclusion, they were really driven by um, wanting to reform a, 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 the social welfare benefits program. And a lot of countries are, are coming to this and thinking of how can we reduce leakage and how can we better deliver services to the people. So, um, as my opening slide said, this is not sort of high tech. I mean, this was really kind of looking around and thinking about the, the power of using existing infrastructure. Um, when you're talking about um, countries where maybe 70, 80, 90% literally of the adult population is not part of the formal banking sector, right? And so the, the two sort of key pieces of infrastructure that have really become critical to expanding access are the mobile phone, as I already mentioned. And um, I put this, this um, little chart up just so you could see the, uh, the sort of difference, right, between the traditional uh, a remittance shop versus a, a brick and mortar bank versus ATMs globally and even credit card swipes, point of sales. Right, I mean, mobile phone access and ownership blows any of them away. And then the other critical piece of infrastructure is really thinking about how do you take kind of the, the human interface of the bank outside of these brick and mortar banking systems. And um, that is by leveraging sort of the local retail community. And every, every village, um, every neighborhood in a city, you know, one thing they have are these, are these local shops. And so uh, the, the big spread in access um, has been through the mobile phone and through financial service providers signing on tens of thousands of small businesses to act as their agents and interface directly with customers. And Sarah, so you've probably gotten this point already, but it really has become um, a it's mobile payments and digital payments that have become really the foundational and the transformational innovation um, that fintech has has brought to uh, to emerging economies. Right? They've created um, kind of uh, an on ramp, or I like to joke that they're the gateway financial service. Right? Because what they're able to do is bring people who had been completely invisible to the financial service as providers, despite the fact that they have very busy, active financial lives, 
they, they made them visible. They make those transactions visible once you start um, making payments, receiving remittances, uh, sending money to family members via your mobile wallet. All of a sudden, that can start counting for something. In addition, the, these mobile wallets, um, which are individually owned regulated accounts, you know, they they provide often for people the first opportunity they have to be able to store money safely and to be able to send and receive money um, immediately. And that's um, been shown to have incredibly important income smoothing effects, right? And it, it kind of makes sense, right? So there was a, a kind of famous um, RCT, a randomized control trial that was released, I think, in 2010 or 2011 that looked at Kenyan households that used their iconic mobile money service versus Kenyan households that had not yet started using the mobile wallets. And what they found was that um, adoption and use of M-Pesa fully insured those poor households against um, any consumption loss, so uh, due to like some sort of economic shock, right? So whereas the, the group that was not using mobile money had a, a 7% consumption loss over the period of this trial due to crop loss or an accident from the, from the um, head of household, something like that. Children literally, you know, people went without as much food. In the households that were using M-Pesa, when, um, when some sort of shock hit that family, they were able to leverage basically their, their social networks and then their savings in a time of crisis to be able to keep putting the same amount of food on the table. And from a development economist standpoint, I mean, that's pretty extraordinary. Um, it's also led, um, as was mentioned earlier, to you know, making people's financial transactions visible for the first time has led to the ability then to layer on additional services. Um, the first of those has been offering consumer credit. And of course, the industry of credit to the world's very poor has been out there for a while with microfinance. That was a really, um, that model, while it's had some, some very important effects, um, it's quite a rigid model in terms of how much you have to loan out to make it profitable in terms of repayments rates. The cost of origination of consumers, clients is, is very expensive and so fees still remained high. Um, on the other hand, with digital credit, you're, you, know, you now have services, something like 36 of them in sub-Saharan Africa alone, that are able to kind of peer into somebody's mobile wallet transaction account, see their income and expenditure pattern, and then you know, in a matter of seconds, assess whether or not they qualify for a small dollar loan. And these small dollar loans are just that. I mean, the average loan um, uh, of this service, the first one in Kenya, is $12, right? And, you know, it's, it's really just extraordinary in terms of the advances of um, being able to give people access to even working capital, right? Much less emergency funds to be able to take your child to see the doctor right now rather than having to wait some time to gather up all the funds. So it's really, uh, it's really changing the consumer credit market in these countries. And um, beyond credit, what we're seeing low cost payment systems enable too is a whole new range of services, right? The most sort of well-known example right now is Pago Solar, right? So residential solar kits have been around um, Africa for years and years but they never really took off. And one of the main reasons was that is there was never kind of a financing solution that worked particularly well. With mobile payments, um, you literally have these pay-as-you-go kind of lease-to-own models whereby people make very small payments every day or every week over a fixed period until they then own the unit, which they can re then re-collateralize to, to finance other things. And so, you know, this is one thing the development community has struggled with for decades is, is how do you help very poor households build assets? And so this payment service has really created a way to do that that's just never existed before. 
And then finally, as I referenced earlier, there's a lot of attention too to thinking about, okay, when we have to give um, assistance to people, there are kind of two movements that are happening in parallel. One is a move away from giving people commodities to, um, to cash grants. And then once that decision has been made, as the humanitarian world is moving towards more cash grants, how do you deliver those cash grants, um, you know, safely, efficiently, and transparently, and um, in ways that do um, start to include people in the formal economy? Um, I just added this um, this slide in here because there's a, a little bit of a of um, a myth that says that mobile money has worked in Kenya and that mobile payments haven't worked elsewhere. And it is true that um, Kenya is um, the largest tel telecom there, Safaricom, their M-Pesa product did take off and it scaled incredibly quickly. And this happened between 2007, 2010. And other countries really struggled to, to sort of um, to imitate that model. Um, on the other hand, what you've seen are other R markets maturing, but in very different ways. And, um, you know, this is something that's become nearly ubiquitous. Um, it looks different in different countries, and the level of utility is at different stages. Um, but digital payment systems are really now recognized as kind of a, a fundamental requirement now. Um, both for governments and consumers in developing economies. Um, I just wanted to list a couple of questions um, because I, you know, I'm I'm actually quite uh, mindful of the first speaker yesterday. She was, you know, reminding us all to to be a little cautious if there's an industry where people have their own voc vocabulary and they speak about the, you know, the potential outcomes with with great fervor <laughs> and evangelism. Um, and, you know, we certainly tend to do that in the digital financial community, uh, digital financial inclusion community. And, and I've been a great cheerleader of this now for many years. Um, and, you know, this isn't to say that, that these systems are perfect, um, nor that um, any market has kind of gotten everything figured out. Um, to Michael's point earlier about balancing regulatory innovation, and um, and technological or even business model innovation, this is still a huge open question, even in these markets that are moving very quickly. And you have a real spectrum of approaches, right? So you have Kenya, the iconic mobile money market, where the regulators did make a very bold decision to allow a non-bank to enter the payment space, right? And really started this whole movement. But they've taken a very laissez-faire um, to be kind, <laughs> attitude towards the development and the maturation of this market. And as one of the panelists noted yesterday, what's resulted is a, is a, is a monopoly. Um, so far, they've been a fairly benevolent monopoly, but there are, you know, this isn't necessarily the model you would want other countries to follow. At the far other end of the spectrum, what Pawan will be talking about is, is the Indian government that's been incredibly deliberate and thoughtful and frankly, probably overthought some aspects of the regulatory and policy environment, right? Um, but the common denominator among all of these countries where you are starting to see real expansion of access uh, to financial services markets, even for the poorest members of society, is that regulators and policymakers have been willing to allow the, um, the banking sector to open up a little bit and expand to non-traditional players. Um, but that in itself begs a lot of questions, like around consumer protection, right? I mean, you still, you hear talk here in this country about consumer financial literacy and concerns about that. I mean, we are now including people in the banking sector and the formal financial sector who not only aren't financially literate, but may not be literate, right? And so how do you think about the, the government's responsibility, industry's responsibility, consumers' responsibilities? It's really, um, there, there's still a huge amount of work to be done there. Uh, and on the, on the reverse side of that, I've been in a lot of these central bank supervisory offices where you go in, you know, and 
the team of people that are supposed to be monitoring consumer complaints have, you know, two working computers and a ledger where they hand write complaints that come in by mail or fax. You know, so how can you think about um, central banks and market supervisors um, innovating to be able to, to supervise the growth of safe and healthy markets? And these questions that Michael raised earlier, informed consent. Again, these are big questions when you're talking especially about, I mean, they're big questions for us in the U.S., but it's a big question when you're talking about people who are really, um, you know, meeting the, the financial services sector for the first time. And then finally, I just want to end my remarks um, by saying, I, I, to my mind, one of the most fundamental questions and the most interesting question is, where do you draw this line between what is a public good and may be provided by the government and where the private sector starts to play? And that, I think, has real implications for how these markets overseas are going to evolve. Because what we're seeing in, in some countries is this kind of go-it-alone model of M-Pesa in Kenya, where every provider wants to build all of the infrastructure themselves, all of their agent networks, those sorts of things. And while that's worked in a couple of countries, it's failed in the vast majority of countries. And it has kind of a natural stopping point, too, that, that keeps... Um, that keeps these services from reaching the very, very poorest in the economy. And, and that's, again, where India has, I think, done some really uh, cutting edge um, thinking and work to be able to um, be much more deliberate among how they create a level playing field and what that means for competition in the private sector. So with that, I'll stop. Okay. Oh, 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 oh. I'm so sorry. Michael had asked me, I know there are students in the room, Michael had asked me to put up um, a couple of organizations and reading recommendations. So just to, as I mentioned, there's a whole sort of um, subset of the international development industry now that kind of focuses on this. It's really circled or uh, centered around an organization, a remarkable organization called CGAP, which is a multi-donor fund that is housed at the World Bank, but does a lot of the cutting edge, re cutting edge research. So if you're interested in this field, I would send you straight to cgap.org. There are a number of alliances, the Better Than Cash Alliance, the Alliance for Financial Inclusion, that are really um, helping policymakers and regulators think through these issues. Um, the Gates Foundation has done some really um, incredible thinking around what a what you know an optimal payment system. If you're really optimizing for inclusion, what that would look like. Um, and then there are a few reports and um, essays. We, we say, can we can just make okay, it available. Great. Perfect. <laughs> hey, hi guys. Good morning. Thanks, Michael and uh and christy and jenny for having us over here it's it's really an honor to be able to speak about what the country is trying to do here and and how uh as, as, as Kay said india has been a bit sort of deliberate about uh, thinking how we provide access to a seventh of the global population it's 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 it's, it's kind of large thank you uh this one goes ahead so I'm I'm going to be speaking about not about uh, what is the advantage of, of fintech or what it brings, but essentially how it impacts the lives of people. And 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 all through yesterday and and over my discussions of you know the last uh, couple of years now, things which are emerging is that while there is a whole lot of activity. Which is happening, you know, in in the marketplace as of now, both in the regulatory space and the policy space and the product space, everything else. There are just two key trends which are emerging. Those two key trends for us is that tech advances are enabling innovation. That's 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 that is, I think is the is the underlying thing that they're agile, low cost, and they are providing specialized services. The, and the second is that the world is going digital. Nothing new, right? How many of us use phones? Everybody does. How many of us are on Google? Everybody is. Almost 
except for iOS. And, you know, and, and so we are all going digital. And people are, are demanding and consuming more services. This happens almost every day. Keeping that in mind, l- let me walk you through today what India is. On one hand, today, some of large numbers that you will see that 1.2 billion people have unique identities, biometric, electronic, digital. And we'll talk, out, talk about what that means in terms of service delivery. There are more than a billion mobile phones in the country today. Uh, we have about 900 million digital accounts, about uh, 300 million of them got opened in the last about three years. Uh, with a clarion call from the prime minister, there were queues at the bank, unheard of, queues at the bank by people to open bank accounts. And the bank didn't have the capacity to solve for that very quickly, although they tried to, it had errors, but still they were, I haven't heard of an occasion where people are queuing outside banks to open accounts. Uh, the, the other is that uh, today the government claims that every household has at least one bank account. And that's very important for, for the way the government is, is thinking about it, is because if you do need to pass on price subsidies and welfare payments into families, you do need a bank account to which to to be able to pay those things instead of handing over cash or or some stuff in kind, which is open to leakages and corruption. Uh, there are about 800 million debit cards in the country today. Uh, expensive. It needs a whole lot of ecosystem for it to work. Uh, but nevertheless, they exist. And we have about 350 million smartphones growing at about 30% a year. And and the latest uh, challenger in the telco uh, market uh, called Reliance Geo is coming up with what it calls is a smart feature phone. So it's a combination of things you can do on a feature phone, but uh, on a smartphone. But actually, it's a feature phone with a larger scheme. That's that's an innovation itself, and that 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 that, that costs about uh, you know. Uh, a very, very small amount of 1,500 rupees, which is a very small fund. And that too is free because it's refundable after three years. So so, so the cost to get that to the customer is is, is very cheap. Uh, the, re- the regulator has been very thoughtful about this. And and, and, and although it's a, it's a very regimented regulator, in the last two years, they've given away 21 new banking licenses and, and differentiated ones. So you have a specific one for payments only. You've got a small finance bank. You've got all sorts of and the and the payment banks are today can be applied by even by a telco. So Airtel or Vodafone have licenses to be banks under the payment banks license. So that's another way of looking and saying that if my banking industry, the way it is structured today is unable to deliver services to the poor and remote corners of the country just because they are structured in high cost will i keep them still in the loop to be able to go and deliver it or should i go out and create an, a new mechanism which will help those guys to reach there and and the telcos fit their bill because as compared with about 150000 or branches of banks Telcos have about 1.5 million retailers spread across the country. Uh, and, and the last one which Kay spoke about is, is improved governance. So just the fact that the people have a bank account and the government is committed to reduce corruption and leakages in the system, they've gone away and said, can we transfer funds directly into the bank accounts of people? That's been a huge success. About 140 million people guests get cooking gas subsidy in the bank accounts every month. About uh, 250 million families, which is about 800 million people, they get food subsidies, mm-hmm. although in kind, but there, there, are, there is a process on to see which one of them can actually move to cash. Mm-hmm. Then there is fertilizer subsidy, which is impacting over 100 million or farmers. Uh, so, uh, small farmers and the and the and the price subsidy also act in a different way that they allow the market to 
not work in a rational way because if you if you p- provide a higher subsidy on urea and even if your soil doesn't need urea as a farmer you're likely to go and buy more urea and utilize it it distorts the market it it impacts the soil it impacts production so the, you know it's a it's an ongoing thing on the other hand everything is being disrupted in, in the banking world right every banking services you could think of is is today being disrupted uh and and how is this happening so just try and so i'm going to introduce to you what we call as the india stack uh, india stack is a is a combination of of technologies which come together so it talks about being uh it, it has a consent layer it's it, it's got a cashless layer it's got a paperless layer it's got a presenceless layer i'm going to talk about this a little bit more on the next slide when i want you to start to see the impact of this so the india stack is split into two parts so there is is the what we call is the identity highway or the information highway and then uh, then uh, then we have is the payment highway there are lots of numbers on this but let me stop here and tell you two stories when you look at the slide i would want you to think of uber right what did uber do on its own uber used location based services and gps uber used existing payment gateway services and brought it together uber used skills of its tech guys to bring it all together and provide a service which is now being used by all almost everybody you know a large number of us at least uh, doing that just try and imagine if if uber had to build those things themselves what would be the impact on cost of services and how long it would have gone and taken but here what uber's gone and done is is what we talk about is layered innovation so they've used layers of of things which already exist and brought them in together in a newer way to ride cabs to hail cabs right in a similar way if you utilize this to see you know on the on the stack you'll see ekyc e consent uh, digilocker and e signature here's a use case for you what we've done an experiment with is a sme who can store his financial transaction data in the digilocker can provide access to credit aggregators or to banks themselves for opting out saying that i want 100000 dollars of a loan what can you offer me at and provide a link or a key to his to his data those banks can run their own algos and come back with an offer of of saying here's what we can offer you at he can choose one of them e sign the contract and get money transferred into his bank account in less than 10 minutes yeah is it bad is it good in terms of of convenience in terms of availability fantastic in terms of uh seeing whether this is uh, responsible or not does he need the credit is it is it is it um it, is it suitable for him is it over indebtedness what he's going to talk about are are things which will we have started to come in as we start to think about these issues let me also also tell you what this able to do so on the payment highway side you will find the last one saying unified payment interface a unified payment interface today allows a customer with a bank account and we said that we've got about 900 million odd bank accounts to transfer funds from one bank account to the other almost instantaneously real time at a fraction of a cost since it was launched we've seen uh, it has hit about 76 million transactions a month and we what we are seeing in in november is about 5 million transactions a day so the ability to move money very quickly within the system generates benefits to the economy it's such and let me also tell you what this what what this does this also allows other non banks to come and have a role in the in the in the in the payment system of the country so as an example google tays which is a 
payment app from Google, which launched in India about a month ago, is today, so 90% of smartphones in the country run on Android. So Google has suddenly acquired 60% of the transactions of 76 million transactions that were done in October. Right? Isn't that phenomenal? How, the question is how many of them will reach the poor? And we'll talk about that. Let me also tell you what this does to costing. Because the other thing is that once you need to reach the poor, you have to ensure that the cost comes down. Because at $10 acquisition cost, you can only acquire X number of customers. Because you need that, that return to come in from that a investment you've made in onboarding him. But the moment you start declining costs of transaction, you can get a lot more pe uh, people who wouldn't have those kind of transactions or balances to still come onto the platform and be uh, uh, be profitable. So traditional banks would do the paper-based KYC at about $5. Today, by using eKYC, that has come down to about $0.07. Cents. That's not all. The efficiency comes from that you could take about three days to open a bank account. You could get about, you, you could spend about two days to get a SIM card activated at a telco. You can today walk in and activate a SIM card in less than five minutes and walk away. You can open a bank account in less than five minutes and walk away. The poor people don't need to go there again and again with, with the paper and saying, this paper today is missing, the other paper is missing, your uh, signs, your signature isn't working. The cost of acquisition of customer, both on the product side, both on the customer side, as well as the organization side, was immensely high. But what all this is going to do is it's, it's, it's going to make us data rich from where we are today, data poor. So all the things that you do on social, on, on commerce, on payments, everything is going to just change the way we do things. And that is scary, right? So we've been speaking about you know, data protection, data con con consent layers, and everything else. We ran some, some research recently, and I'll, I'll send you the link. The uh, top line is people care about data. They also care about saying that if I get the benefits of this, I'm happy to share my data. But I hope you'll keep it safe. And, and you'll let me know if, if you're doing something with it. And can I, can I get control? I'm happy to share that with you if that happens. That's a very strong view that you know, is emerging. Right. This was a, a very small study. It wasn't so deep. So it's more insight driven and, 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 and some directions of, of where we might go. And Michael's a part of, of uh, he is an advisor to what we are doing in India is called the Future of Finance Initiative, which is, is looking at these things very deeply and saying which is the right way to go. And the way we guys are thinking about uh, that is, is by saying, uh, so on one side, what we have is the user rights. What is a user data rights? Uh, where we are saying is, how do you collect and use data? What, what is the quality and retention and, and, and even destruction and, and in terms of accountability of data? And, and on the other side is, is uh, laws which, which, are, which are around a liability of things if things go wrong who owns that data and underlying this is a very humanized wrestle kind of system where to go if things don't work right and all said and done i think the one question which which i'm going to leave on the table and uh, and hopefully we will discuss this as the day goes on today is will fintech fail to deliver on financial inclusion? Is there a possibility? So there are some preconditions which I believe uh, will need to be met. So is there network coverage across the country? So if you take in India, there are 3.29 million square kilometers, much smaller than the US, but you have all sorts of areas, deep rural, deep tribal, uh, 
bordering on on uh, other countries where you can't beam into those countries so you can't have towers there so all sorts of things will you ever have coverage in the entire country one two is economic uh, barriers what is the cost how do you bring down the cost of these uh, transactions so if people were creating their own apps and doing everything else on their own will they ever be able to do it are the venture capitalists today agreeable to invest in 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 fintech which are going to look at the bottom of the pyramid the answer is maybe no while there is a still large marketplace about 800 million odd people who are under two dollars a day you're saying no i'm still not interested why i'm not interested long gestation small value transactions am i going to get back my own money where who's going to invest in that area right the market coordination failures could emerge out of this if they're not addressed to right now and that could be immense and we are also talking about information asymmetries just by the fact that we are now talking on this infrastructure which is a public good which is not utility and this is not owned by by the private guys we have a very good chance of removing that to say that there is an uh, uh, a level playing field available to people to be able to build on i think in the and the last point i'm going to stop at is that unless the regulator and policy makers stay ahead of the curve which is usually difficult because they usually follow innovation instead of staying ahead of it our our work on the future of a financial initiative is just trying to do that is to just stay ahead of the curve work with the regulators work with with the policy makers tell them what's coming how is going to come start to think about what's happening in india and rest of the world and hopefully we we firmly kind of believe that we are on a path although it's an experiment right now but we we are on the right experiment and we are on the path to be financially included and i'm i'm sure i don't have the numbers yet but the new uh, fintech survey results which will which will come out sometime in 2018 we will see some of the results of this happening on the data and you see some huge upsides thank you Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So first, I'd like to start off. My name is uh, Joshua Sledge. I'm a director at the Center for Financial Services Innovation. Uh, I wanted to start off by first thanking the Office of Financial Research and uh, the Center for Finance, um, Law, and Policy for uh, inviting me to to speak here today. I am a proud Wolverine, so I'll look for any excuse I can to get back to Ann Arbor and definitely go blue. Um, so Kay and Pollen did a, a really fantastic job painting a picture of the international um, uh, activity and work that's being done to uh, bring FinTech in as a tool for financial inclusion. And I'm gonna pivot a bit to look at the domestic picture and talk about how uh, there's potential for FinTech to address the financial challenges of underserved consumers in the United States, and then share a few examples of organizations uh, and companies that are, are doing just that. Fantastic. But first off, for those of you that may not be familiar with uh, my organization, the Center for Financial Services Innovation, I'll give you a brief uh, brief overview. CFSI is a, a nonprofit organization with the mission to advance the financial health of American households. And we define financial health as having a day-to-day -day financial system that works well, it enables you to build up resilience to financial shocks, and it allows you to pursue whatever opportunities are most important to you. So it's a simple definition, but unfortunately, we did a survey a couple of years back and found that 57% of American households fail short of that standard. So our goal is to change that. And we do that primarily by working with a network of financial services innovators who are committed to this idea of financial health. It's large, very diverse. It spans from the biggest banks in the country all the way to local credit unions, to nonprofit organizations, fintech startups, credit bureaus really any organizations or companies that are interested in thinking and engaged in this topic of financial health, uh, we wanna work with them. Among other things, we provide research and consulting services. And a key thing that we do is really to try to provide support for emerging solutions uh, that are, are aimed at, at, at improving consumer financial health. Most notably, we do that through an initiative called our Financial Solutions Lab. It's a five-year partnership that CFSI conducts uh, with, with J.P. Morgan Chase. And the goal each year is to put out a call and ask 
for all emerging startups and nonprofit innovators that are creating new tools uh, to apply. And we select a cohort of about eight to 10 companies and organizations each year and provide them with the resources they need, uh, capital, technical assistance, consultants, uh, visibility, connections in our network, really whatever they need to scale, uh, refine their products and get it into the hands of, of people that need it. So I'll talk a little bit more about the, the lab and, and uh, some of the, the solutions we're seeing come out of it uh, in a bit. But I first want to start by you know, answering the question, when we talk about financial inclusion, who are we talking about trying to include? Uh, so there's a number of ways that you can really approach this question. And I, we always like to frame it by the particular challenges uh, that, that households may be facing. So first off, you start with income, right? Um, typically, we're, we're very interested in making sure that the financial services system works in a way for low and moderate income individuals. And we estimate that uh, there's 91 million low and moderate income adults in the United States, defined as uh, coming below 200% of the, the federal poverty level. Uh, but as Kay pointed out on the international segment, more and more domestically, we're looking not just at how much money you make in aggregate, but how that money flows into your, to your home, this issue of income volatility. If you think about a lot of financial services, you've got monthly payments, things are static, things are consistent. What we're finding is for many households, that's not how they're income actually works. Uh, depending on whether or not your hours get cut or maybe you've got a side job or you see a lot of changing in household composition with relatives coming in and out, uh, the amount of money that's coming in in any given month can vary significantly. And particularly in those months where you've got a shortage, these can cause some financial emergencies and really cause a lot of financial stress and challenges for households. So next, if you, you take a look, we're, we're looking at a, a segment that we call credit challenged. And these are individuals that have a hard time accessing traditional forms of credit, you know, a credit card at a bank, a personal loan, um, typically things that you need to have a credit score in order to access. Uh, and many people, again, 121 million consumers in, in the United States are credit challenged. They either have a credit score that falls below the threshold uh, that's often set for those types of products, or they're what is called a credit invisible. Uh, this is a, con a concept in a, an area of study that the um, uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has been focusing on. These are people that don't have a credit score either because they don't have it as enough of a credit history to generate a score or have no credit history at all. And for many lenders, if you don't have a credit history, that's the same as having a bad one. So you typically see this problem emerge with younger people, particularly with recent immigrants to the United States that may not have been able to bring over um, with them their, their credit history. So you add, there's about 45 million credit invisibles at the subprime segment, you get to that 121 million people that are credit challenged in the United States. And last but not least, of course, there are the un and under bank, people that either don't have any relationship with a financial institution, or they may have a checking or savings account, but are still using alternative financial services uh, like check cashers or, or payday lenders. And there's about 67 million uh, adults in, in America that, that fall into that category, according to some really great work by the, the FDIC. So these are not distinct segments. They often overlap. And in cases where they do, that can really compound the challenges for an individual household. So you know, how do these folks manage their, their financial their lives on an ongoing basis? Well, they use a real variety of services that really range in quality. You know, it can go all the way from using traditional bank products to using some of those alternative financial uh, services that may be high cost and come with risk to their uh, overall uh, the, the safety of, of the consumer. But in total, we estimate that underserved consumers spend $141 billion a year in fees and interest for the financial products they use. So this is a large group of people and a large marketplace. So there's a lot of opportunity to create better solutions that meet the needs of underserved consumers. Now, in doing that, designing those products, what are the types of attributes that underserved consumers are looking for in their financial services? Well, I've listed a, a few here. Uh, number one, speed and certainty. Oftentimes, if you're living paycheck to paycheck, you may be making bill payments for or bills on a just-in-time basis. You need to be sure that when you make that transaction, it's processed quickly and that it's process correctly so that it's not causing you any issues. Uh, the second component, fairness and predictability. What you see again, $141 billion being spent, people are willing to spend money as long as it's predictable. Uh, for many households, the last thing they can afford is a surprise fee, an overdraft, something that can really throw their entire financial life out of whack. So you may see someone who's willing to cash a check and pay a higher fee up front for the certainty that there won't be any fees coming on the back end. 
Um, so, you know, that, that kind of degree of predictability is, is really important. Uh, and lastly, accessibility. This is oftentimes still a cash preferred consumer. Uh, being able to, uh, you know, um, either access an ATM or, or uh, uh, walk into a, a bank branch or uh, um, a retail outlet is still really important, again, especially when it comes to those just-in-time uh, urgent needs. So again, we think that there's an opportunity to, to, to build here, and in particular, we think there is when it comes to uh, leveraging technology. So right now we're seeing tailwinds both on the provider side and on the consumer side. So on the provider side, we're seeing this wave of investment. And I'm sure you have been talking about it the last, you know, certainly yesterday, um, and we'll talk about it more today, but this wave of investment and innovation that is happening uh, around financial technology. Uh, the graph here is from uh, some research that the KPMG does on a, on a quarterly basis. And you can see since about 2010, there's been almost $100 billion invested in the fintech space. Uh, it really runs the gamut. That's including digital currencies. That's including, um, uh, in, you know, um, platforms for investment management, things that may not have direct and immediate applicability to underserved consumers. But with our Financial Solutions Lab, we're seeing the same uh, degree of innovation and uh, um, uh, startups and, and, and entrepreneurship around fintech for financial health. So last year, you know, each year again, we kind of put out this application call. Last year, we received 361 applications from organizations that are building consumer-facing products designed to improve financial health. That was slightly up over the year prior and 20% higher than what we saw in 2015. So we're seeing a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of talent, a lot of investment, and a lot of innovation happening in creating new fintech products. Now, on the consumer side, we're seeing, I, I think, as, as Powell and Kay pointed out on the international side, increasing access to the types of tools uh, that you're going to need to use a fintech product, most notably uh, mobile phone technology. Uh, the Federal Reserve does, again, some really fantastic work uh, looking at mobile banking, the, the usage and, and adoption rates each year. They found in their most recent iteration, 76% of, of households that make less than $25,000 a year have a, a mobile phone. Right. So and that number increases with income and that trend has been increasing over time. Same thing in the smartphone enabled space. So we're seeing increasingly more people being able to access just to have the basic tool to access uh, fintech products. And at the same time, when it comes to actually using their phone for banking services or financial services, um, we're seeing underbank consumers actually use their phone for mobile banking at a higher rate than fully banked. Uh, individuals. And oftentimes you see this because in some households, your smartphone may be your primary source of accessing the internet. Uh, the underbanked population tends to skew younger in a way that smartphone ownership does as well. So as you're thinking about these underserved consumer segments, they're becoming mobile enabled and more familiar with uh, and comfortable with using fintech products to manage their financial lives. So you add all this up and you start to see that there could be some potential for new investments, new solutions that are coming about that are meeting the needs of underserved consumers, their needs for certainty, speed and transparency, increasing efficiency and ideally also improving their overall financial health. So a few examples of places where we're starting to see this occur already, and I kind of lumped them into a few categories that I think are, are uh, interesting to, to think about. So the number one, you kind of tried and true, your typical startup solutions. These are kind of early stage companies, many of which, again, are the type of organizations that we invest in via the Financial Solutions Lab. I highlight a couple of them here. The first one is Propel, uh, who, who makes a product called Fresh EBT. Uh, Propel, the founders of Propel uh, did some consumer research and realized that the process for signing up for SNAP benefits or, or food stamps is incredibly cumbersome. It's time intensive. People may be sitting in a government office for an entire day, um, almost to the same point that Powell made. If you forget a document, you've got to come back the next day. Uh, it's a very complicated process. So they created an app that allowed people to sign up uh, and enroll in and, um, SNAP benefits via their smartphone. They then realized that oftentimes, even if you've got the card, it's pretty difficult to manage it. If you want to know what your balance is, you have to call in to a hotline, dial in your phone number, and they'll tell you what it is. So in order to improve the efficiency and the transparency of, of, of how the card operates, they built Fresh EBT, uh, which enables people to see their balance, their transactions um, on, a, on their smartphone. It will locate nearby uh, stores that accept EBT. It'll even highlight places where there may be deals uh, for them to have. So again, seeing financial technology being used, targeted at LMI consumers, helping them to make the most out of their money. 
Uh, second is a, is a company called QCash Financial, uh, which was born out of a credit union in Washington state. Uh, the credit union, like many that we see across the country, was offering a payday alternative lo a loan product. This is basically a credit union saying, instead of going to the payday loan uh, outlet, come to us, we'll give you three to $500, give you longer time to pay it, better rates, it's just a better product. Uh, the problem with a lot of those programs is they're very inefficient. Um, typically what you see is the underwriting process looks very similar to what it would for a, a larger personal loan. So you're underwriting a $300 loan the same way you would a $30,000 personal loan. Uh, the economics don't really make sense, it becomes inefficient. So QCash built a mobile platform uh, where within six clicks, a member of a credit union can apply for and be funded uh, for a loan, have the money go directly into their account. So it vastly improves the experience from the consumer standpoint, improves the efficiency from the uh, um, uh, from the, the uh, credit union standpoint as well. And currently they're doing about 30,000 loans a year through some of their partner, uh, partner organizations. I think another really interesting thing that's been happening as we've seen this wave of kind of, again, that, that typical startup um, fintech investment is that nonprofit organizations themselves have started to become financial technology providers, really leveraging a lot of the insights, the experience that they have, working with underserved consumers, understanding their needs, and being able to build platforms to serve them more effectively. A couple examples here. The first one is an organization called Earn out in the, the Bay Area, uh, another one of our Financial Solution Lab winners. Uh, Earn was a pioneer in the match savings um, field uh, years ago. This is essentially if somebody's trying to save up for a goal, maybe starting a business or buying their first home, they work with the program, they get some guidance and support, and for every dollar they, the dollar they put into a savings account, it gets matched, um, oftentimes through philanthropic or government, um, government funds. Realizing the power of savings and understanding the insight of as to how particularly low and moderate income consumers save, they built a platform called Saver Life, which is direct to consumer. It's now offered nationwide. Anyone can sign up for it, but does much of the same thing on an automated basis, provides rewards, tracks people's progress, tracks their goals, gives them access to some financial experts who can provide guidance, uh, and they work with local organizations to distribute this in, in communities across the country. In a similar vein, uh, financial, the Financial Clinic, an uh, organization based out of New York City, uh, really was a leader in the field of financial coaching. This is kind of a, a unique approach, different from counseling, in that instead of addressing someone's problem, you know, I'm coming in with an issue or problem, uh, they ask people to identify what are the goals that you are really working for, and the coaches really serve as kind of a support mechanism for that. There's been recent research, particularly from the Center for Financial Security out of uh, Wisconsin, the University of Wisconsin, uh, which has shown that um, this is a really effective model. Model, financial coaching and helping people move the needle, improve their overall financial health. Again, the challenge is efficiency. It's a very human intensive model. It's a one-on-one -on -one coaching model uh, that just requires a lot of human resources. So in order to improve the efficiency of the coaching model, they built Change Machine, which is essentially a, a client management system that any organization can use. Uh, and a coach can track the, a client's progress. They can track even just doing scheduling. There's content for them to use to engage their coaches, basically giving them a tool to enable a single coach to serve more people, uh, making the financial coaching services available to a broader set of people. So really exciting to see a model that has been shown to be impactful uh, being scaled uh, uh, more broadly via, via technology. The last model is, is by partnership. Again, we've seen some nonprofits that have been effective in kind of creating their own technologies, but for many nonprofits, you're really asking them to do something they're not designed to do. If you are a community organization and your focus is working with clients, um, understanding their needs, building trusted relationships, it's difficult to all of a sudden become a tech startup. So instead, we see a lot of organizations looking to partner instead in ways that allow them to play to their strengths, as well as bringing in tech solutions in which uh, the, the creators of those solutions are, are playing to their strengths as well. A really great example of this is an organization called GreenPath. They are a credit counseling agency, uh, one of the largest in the, the country nationwide, but they actually headquartered about 20, 30 minutes um, east, right outside of Detroit. Um, they get about 200, two to 300,000 calls a year from people calling saying, I need help. I'm struggling financially, oftentimes with credit challenges. Uh, and, and they were finding that they didn't have a broad enough suite of services to be able to give everybody the help that they needed. So they've gone through the process of exploring and working with some fintech providers to be able to make referrals when it made sense. One of their more successful partnerships has been with a company called EarnUp, which is yet another one of the Financial Solution Lab companies. EarnUp has a, a loan optimization platform. Basically, if you've got a number of, of debts, they will take a look at your budget, understand how much money you can put toward it, uh, 
optimize the way that it's allocated across the different loans that you have by interest rate and duration, and then automatically sweep money out of your account when you get a paycheck that will cover the payments uh, necessary to, to uh, go against that plan. So it really almost provides instant discipline. Um, you, you know, you, you, some money is going to come out of your account and it will go towards those loan products. They found that clients calling in were very receptive, very interested in the earn up uh, um, products. And in their initial pilot, they've got about 125 people, uh, but were able to develop plans that will ultimately save them $600,000 in total across their uh, the lives of their loans. So really effective. And they're now working to scale up this partnership and offer it to more people. So a really great example of a partnership in which, uh, um, again, both sides can really play to their strengths. So we're seeing these examples, these are just a, a few, and there are many more uh, that we're really excited about. But at the same time, we realize that there are still challenges here. Uh, number one, when you look at the sustainability and the scalability of some of these platforms, uh, it's still early stage. We've seen some of them been able to grow, um, be able to, um, uh, um, uh, to, to, to thrive, but at the same time, especially when there are other uh, places where you can put your time and, and, and efforts um, that may be more lucrative, how do you get fintech startups to really focus on serving the underserved? Um, can you make sure that they are getting, um, uh, that entrepreneurs are engaged, encouraged um, to, to really think about the, the, this customer segment as they're, they're creating new solutions? From the consumer panel, I think we saw some of the, the consumer side of things. We saw some of the same things that uh, Powell and Kay mentioned. Uh, number one, data uh, plans. Oftentimes, people may have access to smartphones, but they are kind of going on and off in terms of service being cut on, service being cut off. Maybe they're using pay as you go. Their numbers are changing. And when you have that kind of volatility in the, the, the product, that, that your, your phone, using something like financial services becomes much more difficult. Um, at the same time, we've heard from many of our partners that issues around privacy, data security still remain uh, top of mind for many consumers, particularly if they are starting to use mobile banking for the first time. Uh, and last but not least, with the pace of innovation, we've mentioned it before, and I'm sure we'll talk about it uh, more, the pace of regulation is it keeping up. How do we, are we sure that the products that are being developed are safe for consumers, uh, where consumers have recourse if something goes wrong? And in particular, we're very interested when if a company goes under, um, how, how are people being engage uh, to, to essentially kind of gradually wind down off of a product that's no longer available to them. So, uh, you know, the, the, there's no silver bullet here. We haven't found it yet. And there's still concerns to work through. But these are concerns that I think, especially as we engage a lot of our partners, um, that are all uh, manageable, things that we can solve. Uh, and ultimately, you know, if we're able to do that, uh, we think we'll be able to tap into the full potential of fintech to promote broader financial inclusion. Thank you. Well, good morning. Thank you, Michael and Jenny and Christy. I've been um, here a couple of times speaking, and I've always told myself if I hadn't gone to college, I would be coming back here because this is a real awesome place, except for the winter time. Although I got off um, yesterday, I said, "God, it's cold," and they said, "Cold? This is summer here." I'm like, "Oh gosh, okay." So I'm going to start by showing a video, which I think is going to uh, give a lot of perspective because I know we're running very short on time um, of what we do in our organization at um, Opportunity Fund. 34, 28, 30. Iguanas Burrito Zilla is a quick serve Mexican restaurant. We focus on creating a cool, fun vibe, just make people feel good and get a good meal. I'm Jimmy Orozco, and I am one of the owners and the CEO of Biguana's Burrito Zilla. This is our first location, the original one that my Uncle Paul started in 94. This is kind of the home base here, the purple building. This is where our office is. My sister works up here with me, as well as my uncle and my other siblings. And basically, this is the home base to run the entire company just getting my brothers and sisters wanting to be a part of, you know, this something special that we're building, I think was one of my biggest accomplishments. Early on, I recognized business was about people. Every day I get to come into work and I love everybody who I see, my sisters, my brothers, the managers that I work with, a lot of them are longtime friends as well. So the best part about it is I get to surround myself with all, all the best people and all the people that I enjoy. We were about ready to start looking to open another location. 
we had a real difficult time with traditional banks and more boutique banks um, with, getting a, with getting a loan. So we found out uh, about Opportunity Fund. It was the easiest, most pleasant experience. Everybody was super nice, helpful. Opportunity Fund not only looks at your business and the people they're lending to, but they actually believe in it and you feel like Opportunity Fund is really behind you. As a business owner, we really appreciate all the work they're doing for small businesses like us. It's a great feeling to be able to you know, provide for your family, but in different ways, Iguanas provides donations and kind of philanthropy is a big part of our business. I mean, what, what fun is it if you're successful and your family is, but the people around you aren't? So we do our best to have a positive impact in, in any way we can. Okay, so that's kind of what we do. We are um, Opportunity Fund. Uh, we are the uh, largest community development financial institution, and we provide economic mobility by offering responsible and affordable credit to underserved small businesses. We also do, we're one of the largest funders of new market tax credits, uh, and we also uh, match uh, college savings accounts. For every dollar saved by a college student, we put in $2. Um, our lending is from $2,600 to $250,000, and we distribute our products through a variety of channels. We've got loan officers, uh, primarily in California, that do a customer at a time. Uh, we work with food trucks and um, commercial vehicles and trucks dealerships. Um, we also do a lot of community partners, which is where we get the micro borrowers, the very small borrowers. And most recently, something we're really proud of is we established a strategic partnership with the Lending Club. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, I think one of the key drivers of the success of the organization has been its ability to underwrite credit that banks won't underwrite um, and other lenders and being able to do it through the use of data, analytics, and technology. And what that has allowed us to do is put out about $250 million in the community and do it at loss rates that are incredible under 3.2%. 3 um, our portfolio is about 88% minority, primarily uh, with the Hispanics, uh, California being one of the largest markets for that, about 35% uh, women-owned businesses, and 77% of our customers are in the LMI community. Um, you saw Jimmy. Um, we've really focus on three segments of the population. One is Dora. Uh, Dora is really the unbanked. Uh, she has absolutely no access to capital from third parties. Any funds she needed prior to Opportunity Fund came from family and friends. Uh, every six, seven months she comes to us, we give her about $25,000, $3,000. Uh, she buys inventory. She really doesn't have any desire to grow the business. Her need is to make customers happy and to be able to provide for her and for her family. Uh, no bank account conducts her business mostly in cash. We're doing a lot of financial education, helping her understand the value to go to a bank, uh, at least, you know, to, to do some things, start build her credit, which is something else that we do. We report credit. Um, but she's really what we call at the bottom of the pyramid, the true micro borrower. Then you've got Jimmy, you've got Teresa, um, and these are real stories about uh, individuals who have great businesses, they're growing, but they were not able to get access to responsible and affordable capital from banks. Um, in Teresa's case, we loaned her $50,000 uh, for her co cosmetology business. She's trained over 5,000 people in cosmetology, primarily Latino immigrants who were looking to build a career and also to support their families. And when I visited her, it hit me that she really runs her company, not just as a business, but with purpose to help people build careers and to be able to help them build their own American dream. Uh, when she came to us, she was borrowing from alternative lenders, merchant cash advances, and she was paying over 80% a year. And that's how she was trying to support her business. And when she came to us, we cut that by about 90%. Um, 
Santos, he, you know, he's more mainstream in terms that he does have access uh, to to capital, but also at somewhat higher rates. Um, he's got we loaned him seventy five thousand dollars to go buy a truck to distribute food. Uh, we do a lot of food truck um, uh, financing, which is an amazing business to see the amount of impact jobs, you know, increased wages, spending that that these entrepreneurs can can provide. Um, you know, recognizing how much our customers were paying uh, to alternative lenders and to some online lenders, um, Opportunity Fund formed a coalition, other nonprofits and other industry participants to create the Small Business Borrower Bill of Rights. And, you know, we feel that that was something, and I would encourage you to, to, to read it, because we feel that that was something that was very powerful. And basically, I'm not going to go through the whole of it, but it's, it's six key elements. The first element is transparent pricing, making sure that lenders are including all their interest rates and fees and that they're very transparent in the total cost of the loan to that borrower. The second thing was um, non-abusive products so that borrowers don't get trapped and products that are going to help them uh, that are going to hurt them more than help them. Also, the right to reasonable underwriting. Um, you know, we believe that it is our obligation as lenders to ensure that the customer has the capacity and the ability to pay and that the loans that they're getting are affordable. Um, treatment uh, for um, from brokers, uh, that, that for us is very important, making sure that borrowers are not steered into loans that are higher cost because you're paying the brokers a higher fee. And the ability to provide inclusive access to credit so that there is no discrimination and then fair collection practices to ensure that we're preventing uh, harassment. Um, on, you know, on opportunity fund uh, side, we, we really focus on the customer at the center and their well-being first. And the whole way that we've designed our product to be responsible and affordable, and I'm going to go through all the characteristics of it, but certainly endorses all of the guidelines of the borrower's bill of rights. Uh, we also believe that reporting credit is something extremely important in this country. Uh, our, our customers don't have a lot of assets. And in this country, credit is an asset. And so it is our responsibility and our obligation to help customers build credit. Um, and so we report credit to, to the bureaus to ensure that, you know, whether it's with us or they're ready to go to another lender at, at responsible and accessible rates. And the ability to underwrite, extremely important um, for small businesses. You know, we look at cash flow. We make sure that there's enough cushion in the business. There is no sense, you know, our goal is to ensure that customers end up in a better place after they came to us and took a loan than, when, than before they, they came to us. So, you know, what that means sometimes is we say no, and we say no to about 50% of the borrowers that apply. But we believe that that is the responsible thing to do. So I think I got us all back on time. Great. Okay, thank you. We're going to eat into our break a little bit with questions, but not so much as to make Christy give me the evil eye. Um, so let me, um, while you guys are in the audience are getting ready to ask questions, I'm just going to ask one of the panel and... Um, if you could try, you know, just a, uh, the crispest of responses. Um, so the, all of you have touched on this theme, but I want to uh, bring it back um, together, which is the intentionality that is required to use fintech to serve low and moderate income communities. Um, the technology that one might invest in to serve very wealthy families may be quite different from the technology you want to invest in to serve the poor. And um, can we do both? Do we need to shift our investment focus? Do we need to change our strategies? But if you could talk about that basic question about how to get the intentionality around inclusion, I'd, I'd really appreciate it. And maybe we'll just go down the um, row with uh, Kay starting and then we'll open it up. Sure. I mean, my experience looking at emerging countries, emerging economy countries around the world um, shows that the political will and the sort of desire to make sure that as many people are included in the economy as possible is really um, necessary to be able to kind of make the regulatory reforms 
make the policy decisions. And then at the far end of the spectrum in India, really think about public investments in infrastructure that can help providers reach as many people as possible. So I think there's a very important role for, for the public sector to play in this. I think so, you know, it's a great question. Uh, I, you know, and the reason I say that is because uh, what will drive investments in the rural areas or for the poor populations is, first of all, do you really understand the needs of those consumers? Do the entrepreneurs come from there or they come from the cities and are trying to understand what they do, which is a huge big gap? Uh, how do you get the investors to invest in that area? So what is the lens that you will use to be able to identify what those gaps are and to be able to do that? Oftentimes we've been told that there will be a trickle down impact of, of, of products which get uh, designed for the, for the top of the pyramid. You know, uh, the assumption is a food partner, but you will not see that happening. So the, we were actually working to see are there products which can be designed for the bottom of the pyramid and for which you might see a trickle up effect. Right, so you might see why you why because the savings account still exists, but does it help me save as a poor person? It may it may not be, it's because I need to save for a house or a buffalo or a cow or a or a bicycle or something else. And a and a, and a normal rich household isn't thinking, isn't thinking like that. So so there are whole loads of things I think which will come to come together, and 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 you'll be pleased to know that we've just announced a grant to the CIE at IMM Ahmedabad, which is looking at how these technologies can be specifically utilized for the bottom of the pyramid. So we are, are trying to do that. Yeah, we've taken the approach, I mean, through the, the Financial Solutions Lab in particular, I think is an example of trying to demonstrate that this is a viable market. Um, outside of just the, the good that could be done in the mission orientation, many of the, the businesses that we're investing in and working with are also financially successful. Um, again, there's a lot of money being spent uh, by underserved consumers in the United States. That's an opportunity to, to step in and, and do better. Uh, and I think at, at the same time, almost to the point, I love the, the phrase trickle up, because I think it's the same thing we've seen is that some of the financial challenges we associate with underserved consumers are actually challenges that you see when you go higher up the income uh, spectrum, particularly around things like savings, where, uh, you know, regardless of how much money you make, you know, it's really a, a challenge for many uh, American households. So I think the the more examples, uh, the more instances we see of um, um, these types of financial health products geared for the underserved succeed, the more we'll see both investors and entrepreneurs enter the space. No. Um, I think that one of the key elements to serving this underserved uh, market is to look at alternative sources of data and, and analytics because um, most of these folks are not in the credit system, they're invisible, and when they are, they probably are not lendable by traditional lenders. So, you know, the use of data analytics is very important. And then technology, um, I didn't go into the details, but we uh, established a partnership with a lending club. And basically, when a customer comes onto the lending club platform, if they don't get approved, if they get declined by the lending club, they get uh, they get checked against our digital credit box that we have built jointly with lending club. And then they will get a pre-approval notice. And so that way, customers that are not being approved at lending club come to us and they don't get declined, which if they did, they probably would go to a, an alternative lender and pay a lot more money for the loan that they need. And then we take over and we do all of the processing and underwriting and servicing and additional information. And we believe that that model is extremely scalable. And I think you all may have heard here in the last month, a lot of great things coming out of two other partnerships that have been announced, one by Chase, AEO, um, My Way to Credit, and then the other with U.S. Bank and um, CRF, the Community Reinvestment Fund for um, for um connect capital. So I think these partnerships and technology are really starting to take off because that's really the way to scale with this customer base. Hello, uh, I'm Ari Schwader. I'm an economist at the business school here. Uh, 
and uh, also work at the William Davidson Institute, which is focused on improving lives in small and middle income countries. Um, and I'm interested in actually sort of the intersection of what Luz, you talked about and what Kay and Pawash talked about. Um, a lot of what you're talking about in developing countries was improving consumer finances and helping them. I'm interested in if you've seen work or done work in actually improving finances of small and medium businesses in developing countries and what different challenges you've seen there and how you've seen that work. Yeah, so from the from the perspective of these countries that are building their financial services sectors from payments, you are seeing a lot of loans to micro, um, uh, micro and small SMEs, right? So the people that were traditionally served by microfinance industries. It hasn't really gone up yet to proper medium-sized businesses, but as we as we see this sort of model of building, I, I think it's going to start getting there. There's some really interesting work um, that's packaging access to finance with digital tools for small businesses to start managing their inventory and tracking their own uh, financial flows, which I think are kind of creating sort of connective tissue um, to be able to, again, get that visibility and get data analytics and open up credit markets for larger enterprises. Good morning, I'm Bill Marcou with DLA Piper. Um, an important topic and a great panel, so it's, it's great you're addressing it. I wanted to raise um, one issue that we've talked around the last two days, which is regulation and its impact on access, um, particularly to the to lower um, economic um, part of the economy. Um, and it's specifically, it's the impediments that are um, imposed or, or put up uh, because of regulatory requirements, such basic things as you know is know your customer rules, anti money laundering. In the insurance sector where I work, um, rules on licensing of intermediaries, people who are in villages who might be able to help <clears throat> promote these products who are then deemed to be transacting the business of insurance without a license. So, what do you see happening? And what do you think? Obviously, if every country has to address this in a different way, US or, or non US, um, um, it becomes cumbersome. But what do you see happening in this space and, and what do you think the uh, best way forward to kind of um, knock those issues uh, on, on its head? Let me um, say one thing about it and then I'll uh, open up the panel. So on the Know Your Customer Rule, anti-money laundering rules, I think you'll find um, uh, pretty, widespread uh, pretty widespread agreement that our current system is um, pretty bad at catching bad guys. Um, uh, really quite expensive for the financial sector and harms access uh, both in the U.S. and around the world. So I think there is a consensus um, that our current system is kind of broken. And then the problem um, happens as soon as you ask, what are we going to switch to? There's a political pushback you get. People say you're kind of soft on crime or or worse. There's a, a uh, financial sector pushback from vendors who like the current system. There's um, concern about government agencies about taking the leap with um, new technology. But I think it's um, uh, with distributed ledger and, and blockchain potentially leading one of the answers to this, um, a huge um, opportunity for progress. And um, the kind of approach that, that India has taken on authentication is, is one aspect of that. I'm not an expert in regulation, but I'm there. Let me just try. So I think uh, the fact that it's digital is got a footprint, right? And the moment you have a footprint, uh, you can do a lot more with it to safe and secure the uh, the entire system, unlike cash, which is anonymous. Right? Having gone and said that, the the fact that it's digital is that it's 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 time for the regulators to start evaluating options of how they deal with regular uh, with with uh, with technology as well so we're seeing uh, cases of of rec tech emerging you know, in developing economies we've seen stuff happening in philippines we've seen uh, stuff happening in india who, who's talking about it and i'm sure there are other countries as well the uh, fra in uk is talking about it that is when the product has already been launched i think that there's also need to step back a little bit and for the regulators to say can we can we start developing a safe regulatory sandbox? And when we say safe, 
which means that you work in partnership with the regulator to test out the products. It's not an isolation. So it's a safe sandbox. You you can go, go there and, and, and test stuff out. I think the third thing which is emerging is shared infrastructure. So if there is a blacklist of, uh, of people which is, which is there, why should it be restricted to one organization and not, not, not be shared across with others? So there are whole loads of things which are emerging, uh, which is it just, just because now the technology is available, you'll be able to utilize them in a far, far better way to handle uh, authentication at, at the time of enrolling or post transactions, right? Like India is now entering into a stage where we are saying, can you use uh, your thumb to pay, right? So you can actually land up at a store and ask for well, goods or services and use his POS machine by just putting in your thumb and then you're paying. So you're, you're starting to build huge amount of, of, of trails, but the regulator now needs to have the ability to be able to read those uh, trails and make sense of those trails. No, I think um, there are just, oh, there's one, one, we're gonna take one last um, question and then unfortunately we'll, um, we'll need to um, go right to the next panel. Um, but um, I'm also gonna uh, take the moderator's privilege to suggest, uh, Bill, that you connect with Pawan and Kay after the break on your insurance question, because there's exciting work going on in that area. Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Courtney Stokes. I'm a first year MBA in the Ross School of Business with a major in uh, focus in economics and global strategy. So the other day I read an article in Forbes that said that average wealth for black Americans and Latinos in the United States would reach zero by, um, I think the year was 2030. So my question is, how can we use fintech to not only manage money, but also create wealth and um, wealth for low income people in the United States and abroad, and what challenges do you all think exist in that space? Yeah, great question. Um, and, and number one, so I recommend, I'm guessing the Forbes article may have quoted, but an organization called Prosperity Now has done some really fantastic work about kind of charting out the, the racial wealth gap um, and really carving out that picture. You know, I think part of the solution with FinTech may be that in providing access to additional products and services, you reduce the um the use of wealth stripping products right by creating better products to to take things like payday um some of the higher cost loans to lose this point in the small business space a lot of those products you often see uh either particularly targeted at minority communities or at least uh congregating there so i think providing additional product um options that will number one just avoid the use of uh of some of the wealth stripping products is, is a benefit uh, and then secondly second secondly um and particularly when it comes to credit right if you're going to build wealth oftentimes you need credit to do it you know thinking about things like mortgages small business loans uh college the, the additional access to credit either by using uh, uh, analytics to be able to, to underwrite people that haven't been underwritten before um, or to you know, just provide additional sources of capital, I think can, can help to solve the equation. And I think one of the challenges, particularly when we think about the alternative data space and looking at minority communities uh, that you do have to, to take into account is uh, you got another black box. Um, and how is that black box? Uh, is there an opportunity for disparate impact, either you know, most likely unintentionally through machine learning algorithms and the like to essentially kind of create a, uh, a virtual redlining um, uh, approach? Uh, but I think the potential, again, this is a place where there's a lot of potential uh, to, to help solve the, 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 the problem, uh, but of course the need to, uh, to, to manage the risk as well. <laughs> 